This is a design pattern. Before design patterns were a concept software developers talked about, they were an idea from architecture. This design pattern is called the dropped curb or a curb cut, and it's a small cutout in a curb that forms a little ramp onto the street. In the United States before 1960, dropped curbs existed in only a few towns across the country. Before then, wheelchair riders had to be pushed around by other people and carefully lifted up and down every time they reached a curb making it essentially impossible for them to live independently. Until this man came along. His name's Ed Roberts. He contracted polio as a teenager, and he relied on an iron lung at night to breathe and a wheelchair to move around. He was admitted to Berkeley uh, in the 60s, and he founded a group then called the Rolling Quads that advocated for these types of accommodations, dropped curbs starting on campus and then later citywide. His work and the work of activists like him eventually gave rise to a movement in the design world called universal design. The term was coined by this architect, Ronald Mace. He defined universal design as the concept of designing all products and the built environment to be aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. It's a really good idea. And it lays out these seven principles for things that have been designed in this way, universally. Uh, the first is equitable use, that the design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. Flexibility in use, that the design accommodates a wide, a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. That it's simple and intuitive. Um, the use of the design is easy to understand, regardless of the user's experience, their knowledge, their language skills or even their current concentration level. Number four is that the information in the design is perceptible, that it communicates the necessary information effectively to the user, regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. Uh, five, it has a tolerance for error. It minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. That it requires low physical effort to use. You can use it efficiently and comfortably with a minimum of, of fatigue. And finally, that the size and space are appropriate uh, for, for, for its use. You can use it, reach everything, manipulate everything, regardless of your, the size of your body, your posture, or your mobility. All right. Hi. Um, sorry, that is a little bit hard to see, isn't it? Um, that is better. Hi. <laughs> My name is Matthew Bischoff, but you can call me Matt. I uh, also am on Twitter, and I use it far too much. You can follow me there and tweet me your thoughts on this talk, even while it's happening, uh, over at, at MB on Twitter. I live and work in New York City, but I'm coming to you today from Toronto, Ontario. Um, I use they, them pronouns. And it's important to note that I'm not a disabled person, and therefore I can't speak on behalf of that community. Instead, in this talk, I've interviewed people that use assistive technologies every day, and I've tried to represent their perspectives. I'm also one of the founders of Lickability, a small software studio in Manhattan. We've been making iOS apps for the last 11 years. And here are some of the apps that we've made and released in the store. This is Quotebook, Accelerator, and Pinpoint. And here is a collection of the apps that we've helped build for our clients. You might recognize a few, Meetup, The Atlantic, uh, and The New Yorker. My talk today is titled Apps for All making software accessible. The alternative title is, I don't know how to explain to you that you should care about other people. That's a headline that comes from an article written by Kayla Chadwick a few years ago, and I, I still think about it every day. Here's the deal. Most of our apps aren't accessible, and even the ones that are still have a long way to go. So why, why not? We know that iOS provides some of the best accessibility APIs of any operating system ever released, and yet a staggering number of the apps that we produce in that operating system don't respect users with these access needs at all. I think the real reason is that we make excuses. We say things like, well, most of my users don't use these features. I've added an analytic and tracked it. It's not that important. Or, or we make excuses about our bosses not supporting this type of work in our products before we've even gone to them and tried to advocate for it. We make excuses about implementing accessibility features being hard, 
But, but at the same time, we're eagerly implementing the latest dark mode and iPad cursor APIs before they're even fully documented. And finally, I've heard us ask ourselves what the return on investment will be, for which I think Tim Cook probably has the best answer. He said, when we work on making our devices accessible by the blind, I don't consider the bloody ROI. So what I'm arguing here is that the apps that we make must be accessible. And then that brings up another question, which is why do I feel this way? Why must they be accessible? The answer is that because people of various levels of ability need to use our apps every day. Software is now everywhere, and it's very difficult to navigate the world without using it, without using apps on your phone. Just like it was difficult for wheelchair users in the 60s to navigate their campuses and their cities. One in seven people have a disability or impairment that affects the way they interact with the world and their devices. And this is from Apple's Human Interface Guidelines. So that's 14% of your customers that need your help and need you to implement these accessibility features. About a month ago, I posted a tweet asking to interview people that use accessibility technologies to interview them for this talk. And the response was astounding. I got dozens and dozens of emails and I did a, a few Zoom interviews. Um, two of the folks that I met, I want to introduce you to right now. This is Tanya Harrison. She's a volunteer at the library in Wellington, New Zealand. And she spends her time helping other disabled folks set up their technology to work with these accessibility features. As a blind person herself, Tanya is an extremely advanced user of voiceover. And she also uses Braille input uh, and, and a few other features to, to work with her phone. When I talked to her, she told me that iOS 13 has introduced a number of bugs that have made using her phone more difficult. And I asked her what her biggest frustration was about apps and accessibility, and she brought up a problem that comes up a lot, unlabeled buttons. So this is when you've implemented an app and forgotten to set the accessibility labels on your buttons, and Tanya goes to use your app, starts swiping through the interface in voiceover, and just hears button, button, button every time she swipes. And that makes it completely impossible for her to determine whether she should activate a button or not. She also detailed bugs in her grocery shopping app that force her to ask sighted assistance for help because she's unable to enter her date of birth using the voiceover interface. This is clearly unacceptable. I also talked to Elle Shulman. Elle is a biology undergraduate uh, researcher and a freelance editor a writer of tabletop role-playing games. And Z has a condition called chronic intractable migraines and uses the reduced white point feature, color filters, and voiceover. And sometimes these tinted glasses you see here to make using the iPhone bearable. L told me that while the general state of accessibility of the apps on their phone is manageable, there are still lots of areas for improvement. The Discord app, for example, reads every single server name when Z tries to find out what the new messages are. And Twitter constantly reads out the number of likes, replies, and retweets for every single tweet in the timeline. Plus, L can't play games like I Love Hue, since that game relies on color as a key mechanic, and it lacks a differentiate without color mode. But it's even more important than just helping folks with permanent disabilities. Because the ability or lack of an ability isn't always permanent. Sometimes it's temporary or situational. Here are some examples from Microsoft's Inclusive Design Toolkit. You can see here a, a blind person has a permanent disability they can't see, but someone with a cataract may be temporarily disabled in a similar way, and a distracted driver might not be able to see the road. That would be an example of a situational impairment. Another reason to care about this, at least in America, is that it's the law. The Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990, mandates that technology needs to make reasonable accommodations for disabled folks. And that includes apps. In fact, the Supreme Court recently decided that a blind man who couldn't successfully order a pizza via the Domino's website or the app should win a case against the pizza company because they failed to make those reasonable accommodations and implement the features I'm going to tell you how to implement today. And finally, 
I think it's the right thing to do, even if it wasn't legally required. I think that if you have empathy for the people that use your software, you'll strive to get this right simply because it's the right thing to do. And it's kind of embarrassing when we don't. In fact, Margot Arment, the developer of Overcast and Instapaper before that said, accessibility failures should be embarrassments to all developers because they're usually very easy to fix. Where complex issues are usually less than an hour's work. So how do we do it? How do we get this right? We go back to those seven principles of universal design, equitable use, flexibility, simplicity. This is what we're striving for when we build apps. For existing apps, you already have an app out there. Maybe you know that the accessibility isn't the best. I always recommend starting with an accessibility audit to find out where things are broken or unimplemented and make a plan for fixing them. The easiest way to start doing this is to open the accessibility ins inspector in Xcode. You can right click on it, choose open developer tool, accessibility inspector, or you can do it from the Xcode menu bar item. And then you run your app in the simulator or on device and choose this run audit button in the uh, window that pops up on each individual screen of your app. The inspector will then tell you about what issues it finds, things like missing labels for voiceover, poor contrast, and a lack of dynamic type support, which are all accessibility issues. You can see here in the screenshot, I'm, I'm auditing an app that we're working on at Lickability, and it's pointed out that the hit area for our settings button is too small. It's currently 34 by 34, and it should be at least 44 by 44. Once you fix that, the warning will go away. If you want to check the color contrast yourself, or if you want to see if a new color will improve the contrast, there's even a built-in color contrast calculator that has the uh, worldwide guidelines on legibility built into it. So just choose Window, Show Color Contrast Calculator, and this will pop up. You can put in the size of your text, the text color, and the background color that that text is set against, and the calculator will tell you if the contrast is high enough for legibility standards. Gives you a little green check mark, so it passes for any text size. That's great. To continue the audit, after you've run through everything that Xcode can tell you automatically, I suggest manually testing each accessibility feature on each screen in your app and filing issues for every potential area of improvement. You want to make sure that each feature works, that the controls have proper labels, you've got appropriate contrast, and tap sizes. One thing I'll note here is that it's much easier to have an accessible app if you use system controls because they have accessibility built in. So anywhere you can, I would recommend using system controls in your app. And don't forget that localizing your labels is important, especially if your app is used in multiple locales, because if something's accessible, accessible via voiceover, and then the user can't understand the language that your app is in, it won't really be that accessible after all. The final step after you've audited, filed these bugs, and fixed as many of them as you can is to start testing with real users of assistive, te assistive technology. It's all well and good to test things yourself, and you should do that first, but you can't really know if you've improved your app's accessibility unless you've tested it with real users. So there are multiple axes of access that you're looking to cover to make a truly universal design. The ones that I'm gonna to cover today are vision, hearing, physical and motor, literacy and learning, locality, and inclusion. So let's start with vision. Vision impairments include blindness, color blindness, forms of vision loss, and challenges in situations that make seeing the screen uncomfortable or difficult, like Elle's chronic migraines. For users with vision impairments, Apple's provided voiceover and lots of other features like dynamic type and color inversion, large text, zoom and magnifier. So I'm going to go through each of these features now and tell you what to watch out for when you're implementing it after you've run through your audit. Obviously, the most talked about iOS accessibility feature is VoiceOver, and for good reason. It's really incredible. It's a gesture-based screen reader that lets you use your device even if you can't see the screen. VoiceOver will instead give you audible descriptions. I'm going to show you a demo of how it works. Like I said, because I'm in Twitter too, too much, most of my demos are in the Twitter app, which is a, a good thing because they've actually spent a lot of time on accessibility and got a, gotten a lot of these things right. So here's the demo. Text size slider. 67% adjustable. Swipe up or down with one finger to adjust the value. Great, so we've turned on voiceover. 
we've selected this slider and it's given us a really great idea about how to interact with it even if we can't see the screen. Um, the code for this is actually really, really simple. I'll show it to you here if we were implementing this slider as a custom control, but UI slider actually bakes in a lot of this functionality. So most of this code isn't even necessary. So we'll create the slider. We'll set an accessibility label on it. That's a localized string um, that succinctly identifies the accessibility element. I've shortened it here uh, and, and taken out the NS localized string call. That's just for space. Make sure that this is a localized string when you do it. Um, then we set the accessibility value to a localized string that represents a percent that the slider has been set. And for different types of controls, this will be something different. But the label tells you what it is. The value tells, tells you what the control is set at currently. Um, then we'll set the accessibility traits. These describe a single aspect of the element's behavior, state, or usage. And you can do set multiple traits at once. Here, we're setting the adjustable trait, which lets VoiceOver to know that it can read out adjustable. And finally, we'll set an accessibility hint. This is a brief description of the result of performing an action, like um, swiping up or down with one finger here will adjust the value. So we're just letting the user know that. And many pro users of accessibility will never hear the hint because they'll already have interacted with your control by the time the hint gets read. So that's where you can be a little bit more verbose if you need to be for new users. All right, a lot of information. Let's move on to dynamic type. Dynamic type is a feature that allows users to choose the size of textual content that's displayed on their screen. It helps users who need larger text for better readability, and it also accommodates those who can read smaller text, allowing more information to appear on the screen at once. There are standard dynamic type sizes, and then there are even larger sizes that you can turn on with, within the accessibility settings. So here's an example of the Twitter app on the default setting, and then once I crank it up the, to a larger accessibility setting. Great, so you'll notice that the tweet text got bigger, the labels got bigger, some elements on the screen don't change size and that's intentional, like a tab bar doesn't change size via dynamic type. But even here at the largest accessibility size, this text isn't quite large enough and that's probably because Twitter implemented this incorrectly. So let me show you the right way to do it. Uh, for every label in your app that wants to react to dynamic type, you wanna set a property called adjust font for content size category. You wanna set that to true. And that'll tell the label that it can refresh its text and size and layout whenever the accessibility setting uh, for, or whenever the dynamic type setting changes. Um, if we're using a, the system font, San Francisco, all we need to do is set the font on the label to a UI font preferred font for text style. Here I chose headline. And if we're using a custom font, we want to use a new API, a newer API called UI font metrics, create a font metrics for that text style and then specify our custom font and scale our custom font based on that font metrics. If you do it this way, you will automatically opt into dynamic type for all your labels. And there are similar APIs on other system controls that need to react to dynamic type, like table view cells and collection view cells. Great. Next, I wanna talk about smart invert. This is for users that benefit um, from viewing items against a dark background. And there are multiple different types of invert colors settings, but I want to talk about my favorite, which is Smart Invert. Smart Invert reverses the colors on the display, except it doesn't reverse images, media, uh, images, media, and videos um, in these apps. That makes it so that if you're browsing a content-heavy app, you can use the app and it won't be a strain on your eyes, but you'll still be able to see the images as they were intended. Here's another example from the Twitter app after I turned on Smart Invert. Do that from the accessibility shortcut, which I have set to triple clack, triple clicking my home button. And you'll see that the Twitter interface uh, inverts, except the images in the tweet and the avatar don't. So here we'll create an image view. We'll set the single property we need. Accessibility ignores invert colors to true. And now when Smart Invert is turned on, that image view will know that it doesn't need to invert itself. Uh, in addition, if in your app, for some reason, you need to know if invert colors is enabled, you can check this bool, uiaccessibility.isinvertcolors enabled. And if you need to know when the setting changes, you can subscribe to this notification, invert colors status did change notification. Great. Let's talk next about differentiate without color. We talked about this a little bit earlier in, the, in uh, L's example. 
Differentiate without color is a feature that replaces user interface items that re rely solely on color to convey information. Um, so if we imagine we had uh, a view here that was green if the user should go and red if the user should not go, users with color blindness and color filters on their iPhone might not be able to tell when they're supposed to go or not. So to fix that, we'll check if UI accessibility should differentiate without color, and then we'll add a stat an image that has a check mark or an X uh, to indicate without color that uh, whether the user should go or not. And just like before, we have a notification version of this as well that we can subscribe to if we want to know when the setting changes. Super simple. Still in the vision category, let's talk about zoom. Uh, first of all, you'll turn on the zoom accessibility settings. So I'll show you how to do that here. I'll triple click my home button, turn on zoom, and now zoom is enabled. And I can use a three finger gesture to zoom into various elements on the screen, pan around the screen. Uh, you might be thinking, if the users turn this on, what if my app already has a three finger gesture? And Apple has thought about that and given us this method register gesture conflict with Zoom, which you can call if you have that situation. Zoom. If, you do, if you do that, if you do that, the user will um, get a notification whenever this happens so that they can choose whether they want to do the gesture or do the Zoom. Um, also, we can notify the system that uh, something has happened in our app using Zoom focus changed if we need to move the user who is zoomed into one part of our app over to some, some other spot where something important has happened. We just call that with a zoom type, a frame, and a view that we want to zoom them in. Next, I want to talk about reduce motion and transparency. Um, this is important for users that uh, might have motion sickness or other conditions where fast moving motion or uh, animations that take up the entire screen uh, might trigger those, those um, types of reactions. And I'll show you a demo of it before I explain how we implement it. So with reduced motion on, or with reduced motion off, you see that nice animation on the Twitter app uh, like icon. We turn on reduced motion, switch back to Twitter, and now if we like, that animation isn't there. So Twitter has checked UI accessibility is reduced motion enabled, and then they've decided whether to animate or not animate the like based on that. And we can do the same thing in our apps. Again, there's a notification if we need to know when the setting changes. There's so much more I could cover just in the vision category alone. Um, APIs for audio descriptions of uh, visual uh, of, of video content. Um, bold text, which should apply to almost every label in your app if it's turned on. Button shapes, on-off labels, uh, increased contrast, color filters, and reduced white point. The good news is that almost all of these APIs are implemented just like the examples that I've shown you. So I think if you get those examples, you'll be able to audit and test with these as well. So I'd like to move on to hearing. In addition to all types of hearing loss, hearing impairments also include situations in which people don't want their devices to make noise, such as when they're in a theater, and some users use these settings in those cases. Apple provides lots of different features for this as well. I want to cover two today, uh, hearing devices and subtitles and captioning. So hearing devices, this is uh, uh, hearing aids iOS will automatically route sound to a hearing aid if the user's configured it to do so in the settings that you see here. But if for some reason your app needs to check if a hearing aid is connected and behave differently, you can do that as well. Uh, we're going to import AV kit here, uh, grab the AV audio session shared instance, and then I wrote a little uh, convenience property here called is routing to hearing aid, which just checks the session's current roots output to see if it contains a port type of Bluetooth LE which is the profile that's used for hearing aids. So if we need to do anything different, we can just check is routing to hearing aid now. If your app displays media content, especially video content, um, make sure that that content, first of all, has caption tracks embedded in it. iOS will automatically display them based on the user's preferences, but it's also a good idea to make sure that the user has a way to change which caption track is being used if they need to. So here's a demo from the TED app where they do just that. I'll play the video here. You notice that there are captions already up because I had my system setting uh, set to do that. But if I want to change the captions, they also provide me a user interface to do that. I can pause the video, tap the caption button, 
and see all of the different subtitle tracks. They're giving me a lot of localized subtitle tracks here, which is great. If I uh, want to make sure that this is working in my own app, I'm going to use an AV player view controller and set shows playback controls to true. That's already defaulted to true. I just wanted to let you know here that if yours is set to false, you might need to flip it back to true. Um, if you don't want to use the system standard playback controls, you'll need to make sure that there's a caption button in your own playback controls. And then, uh, as I said, iOS will automatically look for the caption tracks, but if we wanted to change that behavior, the property is applies media selection criteria automatically. I'm arguing here that you want to make sure that that is set to true, but if your app has a different uh, case, like I said, make sure that the user can get that caption view controller and, and pick a different caption track. Pretty simple. So that was hearing, got through that fairly quickly. I want to also go through next physical and motor. So people with physical and motor challenges, they can have difficulty holding or manipulating their devices. And Apple is providing in iOS several accommodations to help people use their devices without the need for the fine motor control you need to, to use a touch screen. Here are those switch control, voice control, full keyboard access that I'm not going to be able to get to assistive touch, but that is another one that's available. Let's talk about switch control first. Um, you can use switch control with physical switches. So you connect physical switches uh, via Bluetooth usually to your iPhone or iPad, and then you can control your whole iPhone without touching the screen just by using those switches. You can use the switches to select things, to tap on things, to drag items, to type, and even to freehand draw. It's pretty complicated, but it can be done. So um, let me show you, I, I've uh, simulated this by turning my Mac into a physical switch for my iPhone. Um, there are specialized switches that folks with disabilities use, but here's how that works in the Twitter app. So here, you can hear me clicking the space key. That's the switch. iOS goes through each element on the screen, allows me to select it via the switch. Here, I'm gonna select the retweet button because I like this tweet, and then select the retweet button again. So that's switch control. Um, how do we make sure that all of the views and controls in our app can be activated by switches? Um, the way to do that is to make sure that if we're not using standard buttons or standard controls, that we're overriding this accessibility method called accessibility activate. And when this method is called, that's the system telling us that the user has done an action where we want to activate the control. And in this case, what I've done here is just sent, send the normal actions for primary action triggered which will do whatever we've, uh, we've set up as our target action for that. But you could also do custom behavior here if you, if you want to. Um, it's pretty simple. Everything else, the how the system decides which uh, items to show, which groups of items to show, is dictated by APIs that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the talk. But it's the same APIs that VoiceOver uses. Um, so if you have great VoiceOver support, you should have great switch control support as well. It's just worth testing it to make sure. Um, if you need to check if switch control is running, you can do that by using this is switch control running bool. Uh, and again, you can get a notification uh, whenever it changes. Next, I want to talk about an even newer way to control your iPhone without using the touchscreen, which is voice control. And I'll just start with a demo of that to compose a tweet. Tap compose tweet. Be honest, comma. Am I on Twitter too much? Question mark. Huh. Tap tweet. Okay, so there you saw me sending a tweet without touching my phone at all, completely by using voice control. And you also saw the voice control uh, showing the, the names of all the controls on screen so I knew what to tell it. These use the exact same labels as voiceover. Um, so if you have great voiceover support, you're going to have great voice control support in most cases. But it's important that you, uh, when you audit this, you learn the commands. You can also say things like show numbers to show a grid of numbers on the screen. You can say show names to switch back to names. Um, you can also say show grid. Uh, there's plenty more commands, and iOS has a really great built-in tutorial for or voice control that you can use for this. Once you've gone through your app, tested everything, just make sure that all actions and gestures in your app can be performed via voice control. Uh, no special APIs. Just use the same APIs as voiceover. And uh, finally, uh, in this category, I want to talk about full keyboard access. This allows you to control your iPhone or your iPad completely with the keyboard and do everything with the keyboard. So it's, it's very similar to these other ones. It's just instead of a switch or instead of 
uh, your voice or using the keyboard. Uh, to get to the next element in full keyboard access, you're going to use tab on the keyboard. And um, here's the API for UI accessibility container, which uh, will help us figure out how to change that order if we don't like the default order that we've been given by the system. Um, in accessibility, there are accessibility elements, and then there are accessibility containers, which contain those elements. Uh, a button or a label might be an element. A table view cell might be a container. So for each container, um, it's, it uh, conforms to this protocol, UI accessibility container. And that protocol tells the accessibility system what the elements are, um, what the element at a certain index is, and the index of a certain element. And just by implementing these methods in areas where we don't have the ordering that we want, we can change the ordering as to how the accessibility system sees our elements. So for full keyboard access, try using your whole app with the keyboard, every screen, every feature. And if you need to arrange, rearrange anything, uh, take a look at your accessibility containers. Next, I want to talk about literacy and learning. These are um, challenges that include difficulty speaking and reading or managing complexity. Uh, dys dyslexia is in here. ADHD can be in here in some cases. Um, there are a few features that I, want to, that I want to cover that help with reducing the cognitive load necessary to use an iOS device and also supporting people with literacy and learning challenges. Um, speak selection, Safari reader, and typing feedback. So first I'll talk about speak selection. Um, even if voiceover is turned off, uh, there are users that might want certain things on their screen to be spoken to them instead of, instead of uh, reading it themselves. So here's how we can do that. I'll show you a demo first. Uh, here in the Twitter app, I've got a tweet that I would like read to me. I will select that with speak selection turned on. Use the menu controller. Log to HNG GG can't stop tweeting. Brain too fast. Brain too fast. Um, great. So speak selection read that to us. How do we make sure that our app um, has selectable text that can be read by speak selection. Best way to do it is just to use UI text view if you can. It's a system control that has this built in. Make sure that the text view is selectable, so set that to true, and the feature will take care of itself. If you need to, uh, if you need to build a custom text view, there are APIs that allow you to participate in the speak selection system uh, available. If we need to know that speak selection is turned on, there's a bool to check and a notification. I'm sure it's getting pretty old at this point. You understand how, they, how these APIs are structured. Um, and the same thing is true for speak screen. So if I had done speak screen in the demo instead, the entire screen would be read instead of just what I'd selected with the selection loop. Next is Safari Reader. And you might not think of this as an accessibility feature, but it can be for a lot of people um, because Safari Reader allows users to customize the font, the text size, and the color for web pages that they read. And not all web pages are equally accessible. So this is huge if your app deals with web content. If your app does do that, if it uses Safari View Controller, it's worth adding a setting within your app that allows the user to enter reader mode automatically, um, as it can make web content, like I said, much more accessible to a lot of folks. The Twitter app has actually done this, and I'll show you their implementation right here. So I, if I go into the Twitter settings, display and sound, and I choose open links in reader view, and then I go to a tweet, click on a link, you'll see that Safari Reader automatically turns on. This is really, really easy to do. It's a single bool that we just need to set on SF Safari View Controller's configuration, set it to true, enters reader if available, and present the view controller, and we're done. Next and last in this category is typing feedback. With typing feedback, your iOS device can give you feedback as you type, as well as speak text corrections and word suggestions. This is a really great um, for folks just learning a language or have, to have trouble uh, natively reading the language um, and for folks with uh, dyslexia as well. So here is a demo of how it works. We're going to turn on typing feedback in iOS's settings and also character hints because I like them. We'll go back to a tweet here that we're going to reply T, to. Tango. H. Hotel. A. Alpha. N. November. K. Kilo. S. Sierra. Sweaty red face with tongue out. Great. And we've just composed a tweet with typing feedback. If you use UI text view, UI text field in your app, you'll get this for free. But if you're implementing a custom keyboard in your app, say for a number pad, or maybe you're building a, a, a keyboard app for iMessage, um, it's important to get this right. And here's how we do it. So somewhere in our app, we will have a 
uh, an input, uh, a, a view in, into which we're inputting text. Maybe it's a text view or something similar to a text view. On that view, we're going to override a method from UIKit called input view controller and specify our custom keyboard view controller. Inside of our keyboard view controller, we're going to make sure that its subclass is UI input view controller. That's important to give us the text document proxy. And then we're going to add all of our buttons. So here I've just added a single button called T button that uh, types a T. Um, in the method where that button is tapped, here it's called T button tapped. Um, we're going to use text document proxy dot insert text, pass a capital T, and then that will inform iOS that it's the appropriate time to give the user typing feedback if they have it turned on. So if we do things like this, everything will just work. Next, I want to talk about locality. It's another axis that we have to think about in terms of access. Not everyone who uses our apps is in the same country as us or even speaks the same language as us or is in the same locale as us. It's important to consider location and locale when we're thinking about designing apps truly universally. So this is a huge topic. There are talks that cover this topic in a great amount of depth. I'm just going to talk about two key areas today uh, that'll get you, let's say, 80% of the way there, localized strings and localized formats. So here we have the Twitter app, the Twitter app compose window again. I'm running in US English. Um, but let's see what happens when I change my language. Go over to settings. I'm using a new feature here called preferred language. This allows you to change the, the language for just a single app. Um, and now I switch back to Twitter. It will relaunch, which happens every time you change your language, which is okay. And back into the compose screen, we see that the interface is now translated into German. And you'll notice that the German translation here is a little bit different than in, than in English. In English, it was what's happening. In German, this, this is sort of more closer to what's new. And it's important when you think about localizing your app to think about how things change in different languages and not just use like a Google Translate or something like that to, uh, to go through it. Um, hire professional localizers or work with your users who, who can help you uh, if you're uh, on a, a more indie budget. Um, how do we implement this? Really, really, really simple. You've probably done it a million times. Um, for this placeholder, for this UI text view, we're going to make a localized string with NS localized string. We'll pass a comment, and then Xcode will be able to read through our whole project, find invocations of that function, and automatically generate either a strings file or an xlif file that we can send off to our translators. Uh, they'll translate it, send it back to us, and we will have uh, localized the strings in our app. Different countries and regions, though, also have different conventions for formatting numbers and times and names. Um, and locale settings provide information about these formats that, that are preferred by the current user, where they are, and how they, how they like to have these things formatted. So anytime we display one of these types of data in our app, we need to make sure that we're using a localized format and a formatter to do that. Here's an example from the Twitter app. Pay attention specifically here to the timestamp under this tweet, 12.51 AM, 3.31.20. Now I'm going uh, to switch my locale settings to Switzerland, and we see that the time is now 24, uh, now 24 hour time, and the date has been reformatted for this locale. Here's how we do this. Um, we have a date, uh, we also see, notice that the like count uh, has changed. Uh, instead of a comma, we have an apostrophe here. So here's how we do it. We create a date, uh, that's the date of the tweet. We make a like count, which is 2401 here as a number, and then we just use the, uh, the uh, methods on uh, date formatter and number formatter, picking a particular style to make sure that these things are localized. And then we're done. Just got to think about it every time you display a date or a number. Finally, uh, let's move on to inclusion. There are a lot of ways to make sure that your app is inclusive of everyone, but I would like to highlight three of them today. Names, gender and sexuality, and race and ethnicity. So first, let's talk about names. Um, it's not sufficient to just ask for someone's name and then print it out, because in different cultures and languages, names are displayed in different ways and in different orders. Luckily, Apple has addressed this uh, by adding person, name, components, formatter. It works similar to the other formatters I just mentioned. This is a new in iOS 9, and I'll show you how it works. We will create a components, person, name, components here. We'll set my name on that components, mix Matthew Bischoff, my nickname is Matt. And then we will use um, 
the localized string from components and pass a style here to get that name uh, printed back out. Now, if my name had used a different script or if I had different name preferences from my locale, these would print out differently. But in US English, they print out exactly how it how we'd expect. Um, and if my name ends up being shown to a user in a different locale, if we use person name components formatter, they will look correct as well. So really important to get this right. And there's a lot more detail on the incorrect assumptions that people make about names across cultures in this very popular article by Patrick McKenzie uh, called Falsehoods Programmers Believe About Names. Just realize that getting names exactly right is a hard problem and you don't want to do it on your own. I'd recommend reading this article, but also sticking with person components name formatter wherever and whenever you can. Next is gender and sexuality. And as a queer person, this is really, really important to me and almost every app gets it wrong, at least in one or two ways. Um, here's an example of what not to do from the Swarm app. I'm in uh, editing my profile in Swarm. I tap on the, uh, the gender field here and I get uh, male, female, or I'd rather not say, none of which represent my gender. I would rather say uh, that I'm non-binary, but I don't have that option here. So that's obviously not great. Um, the guidance that I would give you on this area is to not ask for the user's gender at all if you don't need it. Uh, most apps don't need to know uh, their user's gender for any reason. Um, if you do need to know, allow typing a gender in, selecting no genders, and also picking multiple genders because there are folks that do fall into multiple categories. Um, also pay really strict attention to not marginalize people as either other or prefer not to say, because as I said, many would prefer to say. Um, and then also give people a place to put their pronouns that's separate, because those are two separate things. On the sexuality front, don't assume uh, people's sexualities in your app if you're making a dating app, for instance. Uh, let them specify it and change it whenever they'd like. And just generally let people self-identify in your app and don't make assumptions about anything about them. Also want to talk about race and ethnicity, which is just as important. You may have seen these stories pop up over the past few years um, that apps on the store have racist or sexist algorithms, um, facial recognition apps failing to recognize black and brown people, selfie tuning apps with racist filters. I, I gotta say that this is completely unacceptable for our industry. And no, there's no API solution to automatically not build racist products, but there's a lot of common sense things that we can do. We can build diverse teams of designers, engineers, and managers that will spot these issues before we ship them. We can recognize that the algorithms that we write, even if they're built, even if they're built by machine learning, can have biases, and test before we release with folks of multiple races and ethnicities to spot these issues. When we find them, it's our job as developers to own and fix these problems. So we've reached the end of this beautiful winding path together. I feel like we're all, we're all outside in our little socially distanced bubbles together. But rather than drop you directly back onto the street, I've cut out this little section of curb for you so you can just glide down a ramp. And that's, if you remember three things from this talk today, it should be these three things. Apps are for everyone. Good design is universal. And accessibility is part of all of our jobs. Thanks a lot.